Thank you, Will, and praise team for leading us this morning to the throne of God as we've worshiped together. I hope you have uh, gathered with your family, of course, and worshiped together. I hope you've sung together and uh, just rejoice and we have a chance to gather together once again to worship and gather around God's Word. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you take it and turn to James chapter 1, beginning in verse number 13. We'll read there in just a moment. James chapter 1, verse 13. We're continuing our, our new series uh, on our book, uh, on the book of James and, and the idea that it's time to grow up. That's the theme of our series of us growing and maturing in our faith and, and growing to become more like Jesus Christ. That is his desire for each of us as believers in Jesus Christ. We become more like him. That's the major theme, one of the major themes of the book, that our lives would look more like Jesus and less like ours. That's the, the secret, if you will, of living the abundant life, the life that Christ has for each of us is that we're growing up and we're no longer content to be a spiritual baby. We're no longer content just to drink the milk of the word, as Paul says in in a letter, but he also says that we would would be wanting to get the meat of the word, that we're becoming more like a spiritual giant. Too often we think spiritual giants are only for those that are older and those that have been a Christian forever, and that's really not the truth. God wants to grow each of us into spiritual giants, meaning that we're more like Jesus. Last week we talked about the idea of growing, growing through our trials, growing and learning how to have joy in the midst of suffering. And he matures us in our faith, learning to believe and trust in God's wisdom, to rest and rely on his resources and not our own to make it through those trials and learn to live for his reward. Every single week we want to talk about a way we can grow together in these rewards and what God wants to do in our lives. And so this week, we want to stop and pause and talk about growing through our, uh, through our temptations, learning to grow through our temptations. We want to kind of ask these questions as we kind of kick off this morning, really these questions. What, what are the causes of temptation and really how does temptation work in our lives? How do we view temptation in light of God's character, God's word, and, and it, who it says he is? And lastly, how do you and I fight temptation? What is a compass we can use? to determine the direction of our lives to deal with temptation in our everyday lives. Let's read together James chapter 1. Then I want us to pray together and then dive into these thoughts that God has for each of us this morning. James chapter 1, beginning in verse number 13, if you'll follow along there if you're on your copy of God's Word, and it'll also be on the screen there as well. It says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when his lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift, or sorry, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, He brought us forth by the word of truth so that we may be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. Father, I pray this morning, wherever uh, our church body and those that are not and are watching from other places around our state and our nation, Lord, as we gather around your word together, wherever we may be, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us by the power of your word. It is a living sword that is able to pierce both soul and marrow. It would be teaching. Lord, there, there's those of us, and, and not those of us, all of us, Lord, need to hear these words. The words last week from growing through our trials and the sufferings that are in our lives. And Lord, for many, they find themselves in that season. And as a result of those trials, sometimes temptation comes. Lord, and we have in that season as well, we learn to grow through those temptations that come our way from the enemy himself and learn how to deal with them and grow to mature to not allow those same temptations to overwhelm and conquer our lives. God, I pray you'd help me to to rightly divide the word of truth, to bring these truths to to my church family and others that are watching today. God, may you mature us, may you grow us, may you make us more like you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, if you have an outline there, hopefully you can follow along. And if you're on the church online, the pedalfbc.com live, there'll be the, the outline there is to your right. You can use that as you follow along as well. And on Facebook, you can download the, uh, the PDF there is on the Facebook page. You can download it there if you want to follow along as well. But let's talk about several things. First of all, let's talk about the cause of temptation. How does temptation happen in your life and in mine? What, what is the cause and how does that play out in our lives? The, so we want to talk about two things when we think about the cause of temptation. First of all, let's talk about the truth about temptation, the thing that Satan loves to hide from you and from me. The truth is, just like testing, we are all, every single one of us, are tempted in our lives. We're all tempted in different ways because different things tempt different ones of us. What might be tempting to me might not be tempting to you. Which leads us to this great question, well, where does temptation come from? And really, James sets the record completely straight. Obviously, he needed to make a correction because there obviously had been a false teaching about where temptation comes from. We see really kind of three things about this truth about temptation. Number one, God cannot be tempted to sin. God cannot be tempted. God is holy. God is righteous. God is perfect. And God never allows sin into his presence. He is perfect, righteous, and pure. And he has nothing to do with temptation or sin. The second thing we see is, is that God doesn't tempt any person. James tells us here very clearly that God tempts no one. God loves his creation. He is seeking to save them, not, not damage or destroy them. And so God's not going to put anything in our path and doesn't want a person to be in temptation. Instead, in his word in other places, he says, you need to flee from temptation, run from it, and don't run to it. Because he knows, God knows when we give him the temptation, that then leads to sin. So we know God is not, cannot be tempted. God doesn't tempt any person. And thirdly, temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Please know that temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Because if that was the case, then Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and in other places throughout the New Testament, if that was the case, then Jesus would have been guilty of sinning because he was tempted in the wilderness we find in Matthew chapter 4. But we find that Jesus doesn't give in to that temptation. In fact, he overcomes that temptation. So knowing in your life, if you're ever tempted, just know that that does not mean that you're in a place of sin. So we talk about the cause of temptation. We see the truth of temptation. Secondly, we see the excuse for temptation. We see the excuse for temptation. Two things about that. Number one, people play the I can't help it game. The, the I can't help it game. You know, I was born this way. It was right in front of me. I, I really had no other choice. I, ju I just couldn't help it, right? It, it's the excuse that we love to give of, of why we're in temptation and why we give in to temptation. And God's word is so clear that we can't play that kind of game. The second game we love to play is the blame game. We are guilty of this sometimes, and our society is certainly guilty of it, right? It's always somebody else's fault. When we're in temptation, it's always somebody else's fault and not my own, right? In our, in our, in our, in our society, in our world, a spouse blames the other spouse. A child blames a parent. A parent blames a child. A student blames a teacher. A teacher blames the school. An employee blames an employer. Uh, 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 somebody blames so-and-so, and it just gets, continues to go on and on. What's the bottom line? Nobody wants to take responsibility for their actions. We find this in the very beginning of time in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, right? We find the very first time where this blame game takes place when temptation come and they gave into sin. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the servant. And really, at the end of the day, Adam blames God. Well, you gave me this woman. It, it, it's her fault and it's really ultimately your fault. Adam takes it to the stream as so many others do. Well, it's really, it's God's fault. How could God let this happen to me? Why would God make me like this, right? Or even worse... Where many live is, well, well, since God understands he made me this way, then I just have to, if I give in, it just, it's just who I am. I really can't help it. It goes back to almost the I can't help it game. But we cannot blame God for our temptation, much less for our sin. The real key this morning for you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, or even if you're not a believer and you're listening this morning, the real key to coming to understand about how we deal with temptation is this is that we, we put blame at the feet of where it belongs. That, and that's ultimately, guess where that's, that's at our feet. It's certainly at the feet of Satan we'll talk about in a few moments, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's at our feet and it becomes our responsibility. Now, when I say our responsibility, please know it doesn't mean that it's all up to us to overcome that temptation, right? And God's word tells us in, in Paul's letter in the Corinthians that, that, that God's not given any temptation that is not common to man, that he won't give us the ability to provide in a way of escape. God will help us walk through temptation. We'll talk about that compass at the very end of how we can walk through temptation. 
But notice the second thing. Not only do we see about the cause of temptation, secondly, we see the course of temptation. The pattern of temptation, if you will, uh, that we could see that quickly goes from the end, from the starting line. And listen, that's the problem. Satan tries to hide the end result, the end of the process, and only lets us see the beginning, right? He, he wants us to think, and we see sin as some single act, but God sees it as a process. Now, a lot of us, if we stop and think long enough, we know what the process is. But James just really outlines what the process of temptation is to bring it into fruition of sin. And, and James's call is the same, is echoing what God would tell us this morning, is to, is to nip that in the bud before it ever starts. To, the right response is to stop it at the beginning. The battle for you and I in temptation is won or lost in the mind. But since we don't do that every time, then we need to understand the process. So if we happen to get a, somewhere down the line of the process, we stop where we are. We listen to God's word. We hear what God wants us to know and do. And so he gives us four steps of this process, this cause, or rather this, this course of temptation. First step is the step of desire. It's the step of desire. It's what the Bible here calls lust. Another word we might use would be passion. And listen, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with having passion. God created us with certain passions, right? The reality is if we never felt hungry, we'd starve and die. If we never felt tired, we would be so exhausted. You eventually, uh, with sleep deprivation, you would die. If you're never thirsty, you would die, right? Without sex, the human race would not continue. There would be no procreation. And so God gives us these desires. But the problem is many times they turn into lust and we take them to excess. The problem comes about this desire is when we try to satisfy that desire in a way that is outside of God's will. So for example, many back in the uh, centuries gone by that, that intimacy or sex was wrong, but the reality is that's not the case because God gave us that. The problem is, is when we take it outside of the context of marriage between a man and a woman, for example, when it's outside of a man and woman who were married. It's when we give them that evil desire, think about this, or we fulfill a legitimate desire in a wrong way or at the wrong time. Let me say that again. If we give into an evil desire or fulfill a legitimate desire, the challenge is we don't do it in a wrong way or at the wrong time. Satan loves to put shortcuts in front of us, doesn't he? Think about it. He loves us to, to have a shortcut. Well, if you just do this, it'll lead to this. Or even more, he loves us to question God and is it, or, or to question us. Is it really that bad? Did God really mean that? We saw that in the Garden of Eden as well. So the first thing we see is desire. Secondly, we see is deception. Boy, here is where trouble begins to brew. If we don't deal with the desire, then trouble begins to brew. There is deception. No temptation appears ultimately at the beginning as, as really as temptation. It always seems more alluring. It seems prettier, more beautiful than it ought to be. And it appears, to, it appeases rather to those natural desires. It really happens in two ways. Really, first of all, this word talks about it's a bait, right? It's an enticing. It smells good. It looks good. It tastes good. Think about it that way. It's too attractive to resist. We think about fishing, for example. My boys love to fish, and they're fishing in this season of, of quarantine. They love to fish, and they use those certain kind of baits, all kinds of baits. And the baits are designed to do one thing, to hide a hook and entice a fish into biting something that will harm it in the end, to make it pretty, to make it colorful, or whatever the case might be. And so that's what Satan does to us in temptation. He takes the desire, then he leads it to deception. The other word that means here is to be drawn away from something, to draw us away from the truth, to draw us away from what the reality is about what the consequences might be down the road. That's what happens to us. Something looks attractive. It looks pleasurable. It looks like something that I wanted. Before we know it, we ignore the facts and we grab a hold of the hook and we are drawn away from the Lord. And at the end of the day, there's no one to blame but us. We can begin to rationalize. Well, it's okay. You need it. You deserve it. You're tired. You're worn out. You're quarantined. You have problems. You have marriage issues. And so we make all kinds of excuses and reasons why it's okay to give into our desires and into that deception of the enemy. Dear friend, I pray from where you sit and you listen that you understand you don't have to be in a place of deception. You can see it for the truth for what it is. Thirdly is the word it moves into disobedience. Up until, this, up until this phase, till we bite that hook, we're not in a place of sin. But once we make this willful decision of our emotion or of our intellect, our decision to our will, we make a volitional choice to go ahead and sin in spite of what we know. Here, James gives us the picture in, in verse number 15 of this idea of birthing a baby, right? 
We have, the, we have made the decision that baby is born, if you will. That sin is, is brought forth and we wait until it matures, right? We pursue it until that lust is satisfied, whatever that might be. We begin, what began as a desire, then is pursued in a wrong way. It gives then birth to a behavior. And if we're not careful, some of these things can lead to an addiction. The Christian life, dear friend, is not about feelings. It's not about, it is all about our will, right? You can say, I don't feel like being a Christian today. I don't feel like reading my Bible today. I don't feel like following God's call today. But the problem is, the reality is children operate on feelings. I'm talking about spiritual children. But spiritual adults, those spiritual folks that are growing in maturity, we operate on our will, not on our emotions, not on our feelings, not on our desires, that's how we know we're becoming more mature. We don't fall as easily in the temptation and the snare of the enemy. That doesn't mean you won't ever do that. You will, and so will I. It's not a guilt thing here this morning. It's just to make us aware. And the, sadly, the fourth part of that, of that course of temptation is death. And this is what Satan loves to hide from us, folks. He loves to hide that temptation and sin leads to death. That's what James tells us. He mentions no words here. He talks about not only physical death, and that is, can become the ultimate reality, there's no question, but here by and large, I think he's talking about a spiritual death, a death of our marriage, of our relationship, of our time, of our energy, of our effectiveness, and on and on it might go. We look back to the Garden of Eden, the process, right? The serpent used the desire to tempt Eve. Then there's deception. The bait was the tree. It was for food and the, and the deception that God was holding out on them. God hadn't told them everything, what they needed to know. And, the, and that food, it was good enough itself. And it was right that she would eat it, she thought. But she forgot God's warning and she allowed the lust to overtake her and be deceived. And so she disobeys by making the volitional choice. Adam joins her in that choice to disobey God. But it's the reality, right? And as a result, they were plunged into spiritual death, but also physical death that led to our physical death one day. And that spiritual death that's only conquered and solved by one thing, the relationship with Jesus Christ. So we see the course of temptation. We saw earlier the cause of temptation. The third thing I want us to see is a word of caution about temptation. In verse 16, James talks about this idea and he says, don't be deceived, my dear brethren. I want us to make the connection between the two verses here, between verse 14 and 15 and verse 17 and 18, really 13 through 15 and 17 through 18. It's kind of a bridge. He wants us to see the reality about temptation, but also the reality about the character of God. Don't be deceived. Remember who Satan is. Remember how he operates. Remember how temptation happens, but also know about the character of God. Don't make the mistake. Don't be misled. And that's what what Satan wants to do is that God's holding out on you. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. God's done this and God's done that. But I want us to talk about in just a moment about the goodness of God. And we compare the goodness of God, right? We don't need another person, Satan. We don't need another thing, even what Satan offers to us. All that we need to meet our needs is the goodness and the mercy and the love of God. One commentator said this, it is better to be hungry in the will of God than to be full outside of the will of God. It is better to be hungry in the will of God than to be full outside of the will of God. Friend, we must never doubt. We must never doubt God's goodness because that's when we become vulnerable. We think about the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He tells them, be careful, lest you forget. When you get into the promised land, when you get into the things and the good times of your life, be careful, or even in the moments of temptation, either way, be careful. You don't forget who God is. Which leads us to the fourth point this morning. The character of God. Let's talk about the character of God. I want you to notice here several things about the character of God. He tells us in verses 17 and 18. The first one, and the character of God is all about this one word, God's goodness. God's goodness. Well, you notice four things about the goodness of God. Number one, the goodness of God is unselfish. Thank goodness God isn't like us. My mom would tell you, if I brought her up on the stage, she would tell you this morning that, that as a young child, I was incredibly selfish. I wanted my stuff. It was all about mine, me, and mine, 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 mine. That's the way our culture is. And all of us are really born that way in many ways. 
we don't want to share. But yet God is a God who is unselfish. God is perfect and good in every way. The only way you can define the word good, by the way, is when you use God in it. He is perfection. He alone is goodness. God's word tells us clearly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that who he is and that he is a, he is a good God and he is a giver in every single way. Think about these scriptures we find here in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 24. Let me read these to you. The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Psalm 18, verse 30 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Psalm 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his way. Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see what? That the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7, The Lord is what? There it is again. He is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. And lastly, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, And this is a great word at the end, too, about dealing with temptation. And ultimately, if we fall into sin... Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Or do you despise the richness of, of his goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering? Do you not know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Satan would love to rip this verse out of the Bible, wouldn't he? He would want you to say that God would never want you to repent and return to him, but yet the Bible tells it is God's goodness. Because he knows that's where there is peace, there is joy. When we repent, if we fall out of the temptation wagon and we fall out and we give in to sin and we willfully make a choice to sin, he says, good news, my goodness will lead you to repentance. And why is God unselfish? Well, because of what God gives to us, right? We get gifts at birthdays and weddings and other things like that, right? It's a gift. It's something we, we, didn't, we didn't earn necessarily, we don't necessarily even deserve, right? Right? And now he gives us only, he gives us perfect gifts. God gives gifts that have nothing in them that will cause us grief. If God gives it to you, friend, it has to be good. Because remember, God is the definition of good. He longs to give good gifts to his children. Psalm 84, verse, uh, Psalm 84 verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold. God is a giver of the good things in life. Secondly, the way God gives is good. The way he gives, right? How he gives to us, the motivation, the measure, right? We've all, if you ever get married, you got a, got a wedding gift perhaps and people gave them with good intentions maybe or they gave it to you as they gave you that, that leftover gift, right? And we got married almost 20 years ago. We got some of those gifts that we still have in our closet that were gifts we couldn't re-gift like somebody done to us, right? God doesn't give that way. That's not how God gives. God gives in a loving manner. God gives in a way that there is value to his gift, that the gift and the value of it is never diminished. God gives to us with tremendous love to bless us. Notice also this, when God gives is also good. The Bible says here, coming down from the Father of lights. This is a present participle. In other words, a better way to translate it is, is that it is consistently coming down on a regular basis, daily, often, if you will. He is a giver to us. Listen, here's the truth. Satan never gives you and I anything. No gift. Because what he does give us, we end up paying for in the end. And that's not a gift. God gives us a gift we don't have to pay for. That's salvation. That's the ability to walk through temptation. That's the strength we need, the peace we need, the joy we need, the hope we need, right? That's the kind of things God gives to us. That is not what Satan gives to us. David, at his point in his life, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he forgot about the goodness of God. We, we transition that with Joseph, for example. Joseph, when he was there in Potiphar and he faced temptation in Potiphar's house with the, uh, Potiphar's wife, and he says, how can I do these things? I would be forgetting all the good things that God's done for me. That's the way we need to be with temptation. Notice the second thing. Not only is his goodness unselfish, his goodness is unchanging. Here God gives us some great truths. He says that God, there's no change within the Father of lights. God cannot change, friend. God is always holy. He's always been holy. He's never going to be more holy. And the same thing when he loves us, he's never going to love us more than he did yesterday than he does today or he'll love us tomorrow. Why? Because God does not change. 
Malachi 3 verse 6 says, For I the Lord do not change, therefore, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no change of the Father of lights. He is light. And God does not play some cosmic hide-and-go-seek with us. You can find him. He is the brightest light of all. Secondly, because he is that light, there is no shadow within him. There is no shadow within him, right? When the sun is in eclipse, it's not the sun's fault. It's not the sun has failed to shine. It's that something has come between the sun and the earth. This is like our temptation, just like Satan does. He gets in between us and the Lord. That's not God's fault. God is light. There is no shadow within him. Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Who shall I dread? Psalm 84 verse 11. I mentioned that a moment ago. I'll skip to the next one. Micah 7 verse 8. Do not rejoice over me, O enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in the darkness, the Lord is a light for me. 1 John 1, 5 through 7 said, This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him... There is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. God is light. God is in the light. God produces light. In the light, dear friend, there is freedom, there is joy, there is safety. That is where we can be all that God has called us to be. The example I always think about this, that is the opposite of God's light is darkness. And the one thing, one of the bugs I hate the most out of all the bugs in the animal kingdom, right, are the thing that love to thrive in the night. It's roaches, right? And what happens when the light comes on? The roaches scurry everywhere. Think about it. That's how Satan is. But yet Satan wants to convince us that being in the darkness is the safe place to be. That's the best place to be. You can hide there. You're safe there. But the reality is you're not safe there. The place where at the most full, the joyful places of life is for us to be in the light, the light of Christ where there is no shadow or darkness. Notice the last two. His goodness is undeserved. His goodness is undeserved. He talks about the salvation that comes to you and to me. And it is, it is his desire that I surrender my will to him. Why? Because I did nothing to earn God's salvation. I did nothing to deserve it. I didn't do anything to even make it happen. God simply gives out of his heart of love and grace and mercy. He gives us this undeserved gift of salvation. It is our new birth that he mentions here in verse 18, where we are born again. We are transformed and made new. First John chapter, uh, sorry, John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13 talks about this new birth. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Peter says and echoes something similar in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. He mentioned this here. How do we know that, that, God, that God's goodness is undeserved? He, we know it by being in his word. That's what he says in verse 18, that we're, we're in his word. That's how we know. And because of that birth, we have a new life. He says, therefore, right, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. The new has come. Notice the last one. His goodness is unending. His goodness is unending. James gives us a glimpse and a reminder that God's goodness will never end. He talks about that first fruit of creation as it were among his creatures. There's a sense of the here and now, but also he gives us the idea of what is to come at the end of time. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, he says, These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Romans chapter 8, verse 19 to 22 talks about this idea of where we are now and where, where creation and us long to be. The anxious longing of creation, verse 19 says, waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of them who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from slavery to corruption uh, into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth uh, together until now. Good news, friend. God's goodness is unselfish. God's goodness is 
unending. God's goodness is undeserved and God's goodness is unchanging. Now let's close with something practical this morning. Before we end this morning, let's close with something practical. And, and I, I've, I've borrowed these, some of these and I've edited them for myself and for us this morning, but they come from Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. But how do we respond to temptation? What is our compass? How do we know what to do with temptation? How do we know how we're supposed to respond? Well, let me give you several thoughts. Number one, we need a, uh, this compass to respond rather to temptation. Before I get to those, every temptation is an opportunity to do what is right. Sometimes we want to think about temptation that way. We think it's about a temptation to what's wrong, but, but it's offered this way. It, it's an opportunity to do, do something that is right. It can become a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block. Temptation provides us a choice. What do we do? Number one, refuse to be intimidated. Refuse to be intimidated. Sometimes we feel ashamed because we're even tempted at all. Like, like we'll, we'll never grow out of temptation. I don't care how long you are a child of God, we'll never outgrow temptation. It is a sign that Satan hates you, not a sign that you're weak if you're being tempted. Be realistic about temptation. It will come. There is no doubt about it. We can't avoid temptation completely. The closer that we grow to God, guess what? The more Satan's going to try to tempt you. So you might be alarmed if you're never being tempted, quite frankly. So refuse to be intimidated. No one understand that it is our growth. The closer we go to Christ, that's growth. So refuse to be intimidated. Secondly, recognize your pattern of temptation and be prepared for it. Satan has a clue. He has an idea of what it takes to trip us up. He knows our own weaknesses. And by the way, we know our own weaknesses too. And when Satan knows how to get to those, and he constantly is putting things in our path to get us to those places. He knows where our weakness is. He asks the right, we've got to ask the right questions. When, where, who, wise planning can reduce temptation. Know what your pattern is. Know the places to avoid. Be prepared for it to come. Thirdly, remember who God is and request God's help. We need to be reminded of God's goodness. When Satan tells us something else, we need to be reminded of what God's goodness is or who and why God is good and request God's help. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it by ourselves. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't even know. Don't be ashamed. Don't be prideful to cry out to God for help. God, I need help. Even if you're having to ask him with the same thing over and over and over again. Temptation reminds us, by the way, we're dependent on God. God, I need you. God, I can't do this without you. And always remember, there is a way out with God. Notice the next one. Refocus your attention on something else. Too often we try to resist temptation. We try to, 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 try to get it away. But the, the, the call is here is to refocus on something else. Refocus your attention. Rather than all that temptation, refocus your attention on the Word of God, right? When we resist it, and unknowingly, we instead reinforce it. The more we think about it, the stronger its grip becomes. It keeps us focused on what we don't want to do rather than refocusing on the right thing. Here's what he says. When temptation calls on the phone, don't argue with it. Just hang up. <laughs> Leave the situation. Run from it. Get away from it. Keep your mind occupied with godly things. Do whatever it takes. Notice the next one. Reveal your struggle to a godly friend or support group. Reveal it to a friend. Be willing to take it out of the darkness into the light. I, I've had so many people in my, in my ministry over the last 30 years that I love those moments when they found freedom. And I've found them too. We've all found them. We found a friend, someone we could confide in and say, listen, this is where I'm struggling. This is an issue that I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with. But too often in church, we, we love, and, and this is a really dangerous time for people, by the way, when we're quarantined and isolated, which is why we're going to encourage you to get connected to a group of people somehow, some way. We'll help you. Call us, text us, email us. We'll help you get connected. But when we get isolated, guess what? We're in danger. But it's when we get to a group of friends, we swallow our pride and say, listen, I'm struggling. And you know what you'll find out a lot of times? You'll find out there are other people in the room who are struggling with the same thing, but they've been too prideful to admit it. They've been too ashamed to admit it. They think they're the only one that's struggling. That's what Satan wants to tell us. But the reality is that's never the truth. So find some support. Find someone who will love you, hold you accountable, who will support you and pray with you and encourage you. The last two, resist the devil. Don't argue with the devil. Don't try to rationalize things with the devil. He's a whole lot better at it than we are because that's what he does all the time. The only weapon we can use against him is the word of God in prayer. That's what Jesus used, by the way. How did he deal with temptation in Matthew chapter 4? He used scripture. Put on the spiritual armor of God. Protect yourself. Resist the devil, the Bible says later in James, and he will flee from you. Notice the last one. Realize your vulnerability. 
realize your vulnerability. We must never let our guard down and think we've gotten spiritually mature enough to grow beyond temptation. Don't carelessly place yourself in places of temptation. For example, if you struggle with alcohol and being addicted to alcohol, for example, don't go to a bar. I mean, it's that simple, right? Don't go to a place where you'll be tempted. And whatever your temptation is, then don't allow yourself to go there to start with so you won't be tempted. These are some great steps. And I hope you'll take time when we get through our message to talk about this compass, ways that you can think about dealing with temptation. Let me close with this this, this morning. I want you to think through these truths about God and about who He is. Think about the cause of temptation this morning. It's the truth about it and the excuses about it. The course of temptation, we've talked about it. Those four Ds, the desire, the deception that leads to disobedience and most of all, death. Satan, remember, doesn't want you to think about death. He wants you just to think about your desire. Think about the end when you're at the starting line. And then think about the character of God, how he is good, that his goodness is, is, is unselfish. It is unchanging. It is undeserved and unending. Dear friend, I don't know if you know Christ as Savior and Lord, and I don't ever assume that anyone watching does, but I want to assure you this morning that maybe you've been struggling with some temptation in your life, struggling with something in your life, and I want to let you know something. You've tried to overcome it on your own, and you can't. And for some of you, the reason that you can't, I'm going to tell you why, is because you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you this morning, you can know Jesus Christ. It's so simple. It's as easy as ABC. You simply have to admit to God that you're a sinner, that you've missed the mark, that you have fallen short of the glory of God, You have to ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, past, present, and future. And the good news is he will. His kindness will lead you to repentance, to believe that Jesus is God's only son, that he loved you enough to come and die for you because he'd rather die than live without you. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He loves you that much. And believe that he rose again that we celebrated on Easter Sunday just a few weeks ago and that he'll come again and get you one day. Believe that truth. Lastly, the confession. To confess him as your savior, that you cannot save yourself. You can only receive the gift from God and that you commit your life to him as Lord. Dear friend, if you've never done that, I plead with you all that you are, you'll make that decision today. And there, if you're on our uh, pedalfpc.com live, there's a tab there where you can click. I need to make a decision. I need to pray with somebody. Would you let us know you're gonna do that? If you don't do that, you can email us. You can email me, brad at pedalfbc.com. We'll respond to you. We want to help you know this God who loves you so very much and wants to have a relationship with you. Child of God, for you, if you're struggling with temptation, I pray you'll take these words to heart this morning and realize if we're going to grow, we've got to learn to grow through our temptation, to rely and depend and rest in the Lord and to do our part to fight as well. I pray that all of us will grow in our temptation. God, thank you for the truth of your word this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to, to grow in Christ's likeness by growing to learn of, through temptation. I pray for any person that is watching this morning that has never made that decision to trust Christ. They would do those ABCs this morning and give you their heart and their life. For somebody struggling with temptation, they would find where they are and, and find ways to deal with that temptation that are biblical and right and true and find themselves stopping before it ever starts and growing and maturing to become more like you. God, thank you for this time together. I pray as we respond to you as this call to come to the altar this morning, may we come with our sin and our temptations we're struggling with and bring them to you and say, Lord, here I come. I come naked, I come wounded, I come broken, and I come to the altar and say, God, would you fill me up? God, use us as we worship together through this song of response this morning, that we would sing it out to you, Lord, as we come to the altar and let you fill us and cleanse us. We give you this time in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.